Welcome and good night. You are listening to Petroleum 101 here on Kaito Radio, where we discuss the latest developments in Guyana's oil and gas sector. I am your host, Kimal King, and tonight's program, um, I am going to bring on the chair of the Private Sector Commission, Mr. Nicholas Degu Boyer, to discuss local content in Guyana's petroleum sector. Um, as you know, after the new administration took up office on August 2nd, one of the things it did was to install a local content advisory panel to uh, inform the government of changes they can make to the current local content policy framework in order to maximize local participation in the sector. And I'm sure that as a leader in the private sector, Mr. Boyer will have uh, quite a valuable input to give to us. Uh, Mr. Boyer recently was the president of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and he has since moved over to chair the Private Sector Commission. So he has a, a very wide exposure. And Mr. Boyer, um, just say hi to our audience first for us. Thanks. Thanks, Kimo. Uh, so uh, I'm guessing that everyone can hear me clearly? Yes. And perfect. So let me say, you know, I guess the reason for the mic check, obviously, is because I'm, I'm joining you via Zoom. So let me say good evening to all your listeners. I hope they, they find this next hour of discussion informative. I'm sure you're going to pepper me with quite a few questions on local content. Uh, but just a quick introduction. So for all your listeners, my name is Nicholas Boyer. Uh, my home business is National Hardware, but as a representative of National Hardware, I sit at the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry as a member of the council. I was elected president uh, at the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry. You can serve a max of two years, uh, two terms in presidency. Now, I have been elected to chair the Private Sector Commission. And just a quick introduction about the Private Sector Commission. The Private Sector Commission is an umbrella body which brings together a number of the business service organizations to, so that they can sit at one table and discuss issues that are affecting the private sector as a whole. Because at that table, you have my compatriots. So you'd have, for instance, the president of the Rupununi Chamber of Commerce. You'd have the president of the Guyana Gold and Diamond Miners Association, the president of the Guyana Manufacturing Services Association. So it's more of a table where a group of equals get together and we discuss issues that are not just particularly affecting a sector or, or an area, but it affecting us all equally and so that is the idea of the, what the Private Sector Commission is or represents. And so my seat at the Private Sector Commission is because I'm the president of the Georgetown Chamber. Okay, so I'm to understand that you're still um, on the GCCI Council, so to speak? Yep, on the Council and still I'm president. And that is what, once my presidency ends, then I can no longer sit at the Private Sector Commission as the president of Georgetown Chamber. It would be my successor, um, who is president of the chamber then, who will sit at the PSC as the rep from the Georgetown Chamber to the PSC. Okay. And so that's, that's what it meant. It, it's meant to be this place where all the heads of the various business service organizations get together to discuss exactly the issue you want to discuss tonight. For instance, local content. Because the idea is that local content is going to be an issue that touches a number of varying sectors as well as areas across the country. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, so what I'm getting from what you just said is that there is a, a different scope or reach that you now have as the chair of the PSC. Could you um, explain how distinct that is from what you do at... GCCI? So, so as, as the GCCI president, my, my focus was commerce and the interests of my member businesses, as well as the interests of Ga certain things in Guyana as a whole. With the chairmanship of the private sector, it now brings me into some other sectors that I may have stayed.
my focus as the chair of the private sector commission is that when there's a nationally cross-cutting issue um, such as taxes that are levied across the business community or in our case as we're going to discuss tonight local content it's an issue that i want to deal with at the level of the private sector commission because local content is going to be talked about it's going the, the oil and gas industry has really sparked the interest in it but you're going to have a lot of discussion about it in the mining industry as well mm -hmm. and the construction industry that's something that you're going to be advocating for because i know the advocacy for local content has been specific to oil um yep. do, do you but think... if you could think about it mm -hmm. in the future what's going to happen is that we are going to want to make sure that a lot of our extractive industries because we have bauxite we have gold um, have strong local content in them as well as the construction industry right we want to have um, less reliance on foreign imported labor in the construction industry unless it is such that you know we in other words if Ghana goes into a building boom we will need to import labor but we don't want to import labor to replace Guyanese labor we want to import labor to supplement Guyanese labor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? In other words, there must be jobs for our Guyanese brothers and sisters. All right, now. Um, at GCCI, and as um, the chair of the PSC, I would like to know if you would have had access to surveys or data that could... Um, help to inform us of where we are in terms of achieving local content in the oil and gas sector. Could you share your knowledge with us about that? So we received a presentation from DAI uh, who run the Center for Local Business Development. And they presented a lot of information that you've, you've seen public before. We did done a wide economic study, but it also talked about some of the, the involvement in the in the um, the industry, the thing is, is that you you have uh, you know, the information that Exxon has put out there in, uh, in how much thousands of jobs and how much they've spent mm -hmm. in terms of local content. But the hard part that I that I've been you know catching my tail to really f figure out is where are we in terms of actuality versus potential? Because it's that gap is what we really want to, to legislate for, right? Because you have a certain amount those products and services just have to be bought here. But then, sorry, can you hear me? I think I may have dropped off for a second. Can you hear me? Uh, it's a little in and out. I can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So the, the thing is, uh, let me just switch to my, because we just got blackout. So let me switch to my uh, data plan. Sure. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Works of living in Guyana. Okay, hear me clearly now? Yes. Go ahead. Mr. Boyer, are you still on? So what I'm saying is that, um, you know, what we wanted, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Perfect. I think there, there was a slight delay. But um, so what I was saying is that what we really want to do is look at that gap where we have a certain potential for local content mm -hmm. and we have how much we're actually getting. And we want to close that gap to say we're taking how much we're getting to the full potential of what we can do Right. in terms of local content right and so i was happy to um, 
mean, let's address the elephant in the room, right? So there were a number of as to why representatives from the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce industry were left off. And for me, you know, I was about it, but I, I personally wasn't Sorry, because by Mr. Shamaka, who is a friend of mine, the Manufacturers and Services Association, and we've had some discussions on local content. And secondly, is that I am more concerned about the output, right? Mm -hmm. Because it is for me the importance is not whether anyone who is on the panel. Now, this is a personal view, right? Yeah. Because members of my chamber had a different view, but. My personal view is I am concerned about the output of the panel. Yeah. So I, you know, whether I sit on the panel to me is irrelevant. Whether I have interactions and can work with members of the panel who have been appointed and be able to give them input and direction from the business service organizations so that we get to a certain output, that is what's important because if, if I sat on the panel, but no, we, we didn't do anything, it didn't matter what I sat on the panel. What matters is what is the output of the panel in terms of recommendations to government, because currently we have a policy in place and the chamber had made a number of recommendations based on its reading of the policy. One of those major overarching recommendations is that we need to get to local content legislation, right? Okay. So for us, we want to see and we'll recommend to the panel that we move from policy towards the legislation, something that's flexible and something that's scalable. My predecessor at the chamber, who is now minister in government, mm -hmm. had always advocated for something similar. Uh, in fact, he, he drafted a model legislation um, just to, to kind of prove that, hey, we can, we can do this. We can write this up and we can do this and get it implemented. Right? The idea is just to say, let's get past the roadblocks. So that's kind of you know, the way I would address the elephant in the room. Okay. To, to, to say. Okay, right. Um, I want to follow up on that question, but let's just go to a brief ad break for a few minutes and then we'll come back. Sure.
All right, now we are back with Petroleum 101 here on Kaito Radio. I'm your host, Kimal King, and we have with us the chair of the Private Sector Commission and the president of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Mr. Nicholas Degu Bayer. We started off a conversation about local content. Unfortunately, we got off to a rocky start with some connection issues, but we are fine now. Um, Mr. Boyer, before we went off on break, you mentioned uh, perhaps another member of the chamber speaking to the need for more um, participation from other members of the private sector, other business service organizations Mm -hmm. on the local content advisory panel. Um, I would have thought, uh, this is um, my, my personal comment. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that the reason someone would want to have more business service organizations represented is that um, there would be a wider scope for consultation because I, I think one of the issues that we heard from one um, business service organization is that the recommendations that the private sector made, um, they were not well heeded in the current local content policy that we're utilizing right so so and 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 let me let me address that because as i said so one of the things that why i was particularly not um concerned is because you know i have a pre-existing relationship with the chairman panel and he reached out to me today for instance so we're going to be consulted as the private sector commission and then i'm expected to marshal the troops of all the business service organization who I sit down cross table with Mm -hmm. to get their feedback. So that consultation process is going to happen. Um, You know, I I think what the key issue is that a lot of people feel that, you know, typically government of Guyana, um, whether your previous government or, or, or before, sometimes has heavy handed approaches and so what I think if people are expressing is a fear that they won't be consulted and they'll just be steamrolled by a policy, right? Mm-hmm. But this does not seem to be the thrust um, so far. And it, you know, it seems that they're, they're doing that consultation. So uh, the chairman of the panel, who also happens to be the president of the Ghana Manufacturing Services Association, reached out to me and we will be having that meeting and we will be giving them that feedback on consultation. Okay. So, you know, we can ensure that, um, because this panel, he, he, he explained to me, is very specific in nature. It's not going to be, I'm not sure what is going to happen, or what the plans are after a local content legislation is implemented. Or I guess maybe what I should say is that our plan should be that the Petroleum Commission, when it's set up, will have some function in terms of local content regulation, right? Maybe there's a local content panel as part of the Petroleum Commission. So this panel is kind of an interim mechanism until you get the, the, the more permanent structures that will manage the petroleum industry, which are the Petroleum Commission, and possibly some sort of local content committee, commission, or panel under the Petroleum Commission. Okay, so this, I suppose, is you giving your seal of approval, your stamp of confidence in this interim panel? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what I say is that, and I, I, I mean, I'll tell you straight up, right? There, there are a lot of people who would argue with me, but this is my personal, uh, my personal view as well as you know, some that I've talked to. It's, it's a very touchy subject, and there are lots of views either every other way, but I am giving my personal seal of approval that I'm confident I can work with this panel, give feedback, and try to achieve a positive outcome along with them for the country in terms of local content. All right. So let's talk about the the policy that's currently in place. Um, mm-hmm. I know you came on before and you made some comments about this panel. You've also had with the GCCI 
um, one or two panel discussions where you discuss the policy. Um, That's correct. What do you think about the way the policy is currently structured? Um, is it fit? I, I was going to ask if it was fit for purpose. Um, I think a lot of people have pointed out that it needs work. Um, it, do you believe it, that it ignores the recommendations of the private sector? Yes. It, it, the short answer is yes. Right. So the long answer is that the policy, the policy almost works as like an abstract paper because it's very general, uh, setting out some clear lofty language, right? But to actually implement what is on that paper is very hard because, you know, how do you measure it? What are your targets? How do you achieve? Because if you think about it, let's, let's, let's look at it from an operator's perspective. So you're an operator, and what you are is you're essentially a company hired to build infrastructure that will take this country's patrimony, using the word from, from the opening of your show, and basically market it to the world market and earner, get it sold, right? So to do that, you have to carry out some specific steps where you build infrastructure offshore Guyana, and you also have some amount of ongoing operations one that, once that infrastructure is built, right? Now, if Guyana is frozen in time from today onwards, we know for sure there's discussions of at least five production facilities, which are these, which more than likely than not are these floating production stores and offloading vessels, the FPSOs off the coast of Guyana, right? And what that means is each FPSO has around it a number of wellheads, which they're called trees, and subsea umbilicals, which are pipe, basically floating pipelines that go up from the wellhead to the, um, to the facility, the production facility, right? And then, of course, to support that, because these things are floating cities, in the middle of the ocean, you have a number of platform supply vessels that will carry goods and people back and forth to these facilities, right? So essentially, you're, you're having these satellite cities out there, and you have this specialized equipment. Now, Ghana, with no history in the oil industry, definitely is going to find it hard to participate in the offshore construction in terms of offering technology, right? But, but there are certain things that need to happen in country during the installation campaign. Now, similarly, when you get to the point of production, production is going to be here for 40 years, right? And we should be getting a good share of the value from production that can be captured for local content. Uh, employment, provision of steady supplies, spares, parts for this facility, you know, installation and labor. There's a number of things that are going to happen. And for 40 years, we don't want to have to bring in specialized technicians in and out. Um, for every little item. You want to bring in specialized technicians for things that are just so esoteric. You only have one of it, and there may be five in the world because this, you know, this is deep and ultra deep waters. And we don't need, four, we don't need 40 such experts in Guyana, right? So we need local content that makes sense and that will be here for a long period of time. And while Exxon has been, you know, they've been promoting as an operator, they're doing these things internally, and they have their internal policy, we cannot be dependent on Exxon to be a self-regulator. Nothing wrong, I'm not accusing Exxon of doing anything wrong, but that's not the way to administer as a country. We must build up our own internal capacity to administer and regulate this industry. And so everything starts with this first step of putting in a local content legislation as well, well and 
putting in a petroleum commission, putting in local content legislation, you've got to build a regulatory framework in the industry. Even though a lot has been made, for instance, on the environmental side, on flaring, right? But it's not just flaring. There are certain things that you know a lot of experts in the industry have talked to me about. Because remember, I'm, I'm no expert in the industry. Everything I've picked up is from talking to other people, um, doing my own research, going to conferences. You know, for instance, you talk about things like uh, having a depletion policy, which states that, uh, you know, at what rate you want to pump that oil out, and having things like a decommissioning. And decommissioning is going to be huge for the environment. And, and to the contrary, who's going to pay in 40 years from now when it's time to abandon that, those, um, you know, that, that, those, drill, those wells drilled into the ocean floor? So the regulatory architecture for the industry needs to be put in place. And of course, the hot topic for us in business around it is local content. And we are happy that the government has put the panel in place. And, and I do express confidence in the panel getting work done. But I can tell you one thing. Um, I'm not going to go soft on the panel, and I'm not going to shirk the responsibility of representing the interests of Guyanese businesses that we want significant, as much value as we can capture without putting people in harm's way or sending costs up exorbitantly. In other words, just trying to make money because we're, or what I should say is rent out our citizenship because we're Guyanese. We want actual value added local content which produces jobs for, for our people and which springs up a number or ecosystem of Guyanese suppliers who are internationally competitive. And, and you may find that they may start to export, they may start to export those products and services to, to other um, budding oil, oil con countries, for instance, Suriname. Okay. Could you give us a snippet of, say, the recommendations that you oh would boy. prioritize for uh, local content policy slash legislation. That's, so so it, the PSC paper alone is about 12 pages and Chamber's recommendations, not 14. I'd be very happy to, to share those with not just your news outlet, to be fair, I'd, I'd share those with a number of news outlets. Um, it's not, no, don't, I, I want you to think that we, we try to keep secrets. So I'd be happy to share that. Um, the issue is to cover it here in, in in just a few minutes, and I haven't. You know, it's been a while since I've dusted it off. Uh, it, it it would I wouldn't be doing it justice right away. That's but I'd good. be happy to share that. What I could tell you though is essentially that where the gaps were was that the the policy put in a lot of lofty language saying we 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 think Guyanese should benefit, right? Mm -hmm. But it didn't have the actual hard teeth to say okay, so. Let's say the Guyanese are not going to build the top sides of the FPSO or, or, or put in the, the, the subsidy umbilicals. But Guyanese can crew the platform supply vessels up to a certain point. Uh, Guyanese can crew, and, are, and, and Exxon did, did make a point that they're hiring Guyanese for the FPSO, but how much more can we do, right? Because we need, you see, what needs to happen is you have to have a a direction agreed upon between the government and the private sector, that the private sector is willing to make so much investment, and the government has a such desire that they've mapped out the value chain of the oil and gas industry, and they say the Guyanese want to play in this part of value chain, this part of value chain, and this part of value chain. Now then, we could go back and measure and say, okay, so let's look at, for instance, platform supply vessels, right? We've looked at how much local content is currently in, in that, that section of the, the, the value chain. So if we, can we get up to, if, if it's 30% local content, right? You can look at the value of salaries paid, the value of goods procured, right? But maybe we think we could get up to 60 or 70% local content in, in that section of the, the, the value chain. Then we need to put the policies and legislation in place Natural deep harbor. And should we be going down that road? Mm, but should we be importing labor to work on the production facility when we have a lot of local labor available and that labor is going to be needed for 40 some years? It doesn't make sense to import the labor. 
makes sense to, to utilize Guyanese right here. Makes sense to utilize Guyanese right here to crew the platform supply vessel. So it's understanding where what where our skill sets are and the value that we can create is. Okay, now um, I'm going to ask you one final question on local content, and then I want to um, perhaps bring the conversation more um, wide into the general oil sector. Um, sure. Do you, could you speak to any sort of, yeah. I don't want to call it monitoring capacity with the private business service organizations, um, because you uh, spoke earlier in the program about the data that we have seen from the Center for Local Business Development and sort of matching that with the capacity um, could you speak to whether you've been able to monitor that? <laughs> you know, the thing about the local business service organizations, if, you, if I were to show you, and, and most, of our, most of our annual financials are, are, should be public. Um, I know for the Chambers is, the PSEs is, and you can feel free to pull those, right? Mm -hmm. these, these guys run on very thin budgets, right? And, you know, we, we're trying to build capacity. They, they are very representative of the projects I can get. And we are, we are certainly building capacity every day. Um, and, and where they came from, you know, they were, they were, they're still in the fledgling stage. Um, is it something we would love to do? Yes, certainly. Is it something that we have the resources in-house right now to do? Uh, I don't think so, because you, you need to hire a full-time proper secretariat to do that. Because what you're saying is, can, can you dedicate? You would need an economist, uh, you know, somewhat of an engineer, and at least a lawyer, or specifically who knows trade law, to sit down in one room. You've got to be able to pay them, and, and basically pay them forever. And they monitor... Uh, you know what's going on in the industry because to, to be able to is what you're saying is can I take on a function of a regulatory organization mm. right and firstly map out the, the value chain so Tor News has done a lot of reportage over the past several weeks and a lot of it has been focused on transparency and uh, the likelihood of corruption in the oil and gas sector. One of the um, major stories we've carried is about the presence of a wide range of red flags of corruption in the oil and gas sector. The Natural Resource Governance Institute has put out a document where it says we have analyzed the oil and gas sector the world over, and we have seen a trend of 12 major corruption red flags. Now, these aren't 100% indicators of corruption, but they are tools of inquiry for corruption in the right. oil and gas sector. Um, and Guyana has ticked all of those boxes. Um, you know, you, you think I'd say, let's, we're talking about two things. And I, I, I mean, I, I read Kaito News, and I know exactly where we're going. So let's, let's again, like, let's, let's knock out the elephants in the room. So the first one, I know everyone talks about the contract, right? And I, let, let's, let's first discuss what the VP had said in his in, interviews in the campaign trail. Yeah. He would touch all the contracts except Exxon Mobil, right? My personal view, um, just so everybody's clear, is that for me, it's a very tricky situation. I don't know enough to say, you know, I'll put it this way. What we need to do as a nation is to do a study of comparable contracts across areas. You have Suriname. You have, uh, Suriname is, is as analogous as it gets. Um, you have other areas that could be close by Mexico. And then, right, you, you just, you know, you just have, um, 
those areas, as well as you have um, some. Uh, so that's on the contract side of it. On the side of the, what is it? Uh, sorry, the Natural Resource Governance Interest Institute uh, items, right? Where we're talking about how blocks were issued. The thing is, you're coming from a, a basically area that was frontier, and you need to have policies put in place, both on, on you know, having studies in terms of what is out there, uh, how you're going to do bidding rounds, um, how you're going to do relinquishment, and so that you can manage, let's say that 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 you know that that patrimony that is out there more effectively. Now, clearly, everyone has pointed to the oil blocks that were awarded in the pre in the 2011 to 2015 period, right? But the issue is, if those were legally done according to the laws, then right, I understand what you're saying, which is you have a best practice. And according to best practice for transparency, they do not meet the criteria. But the issue is that they were legally given out. So if we want to change that, we now have to go and change our laws. Yeah, okay, so what you're saying is, um, I, I don't want to simplify what you're saying or put it into a headline format, but I, I want to ask, um, is what you're saying the fact that we're showing up so many corruption red flags is due to our weak regulatory framework. Exactly. Yes. 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 Okay. 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 That's fair. I was going to point out earlier when you started talking um, about how I feel like the convert. There are two different conversations we might be having. One about. Um, how wise you're managing negotiations for a contract and the other conversation about corruption and uh, now I see that you've linked both okay um, well you mentioned the need to do a study of comparable contracts across areas and seeing where Guyana stands um, I think we've already passed that point because the vice president did acknowledge on many occasions that the contract is bad and so then, he, yeah then what i suggest is i, I mean I, i've said this before i think on, on globe span we hold the referendum and the government of ghana has to act on the referendum the government of ghana is a representative the representative of the voice of the people right i personally would say that what we should do is go out and let the people say to the government right we want this negotiated or we want it not negotiated because there's a lot of speculation back and forth. Um, clearly, if you talk to the average man in the street, they'll say, let's renegotiate the contract. Well, just like the British did for, for Brexit, um, let's go take the referendum and then let's see, is this something that the population wants the government to renegotiate? And then if the population has said to the government, clearly, we want you to renegotiate this, the government has a mandate and has to act on that mandate. It's something that I mean, what you want to at least show to the international investors is that if the population of Ghana has mandated the government to do something, they have to act. They, they cannot run from the fact that that is what the people of Ghana want them to do. Okay. Um, right? But I won't lie, it's not an easy conversation to have because obviously the, yeah, everybody's going to start with the sanctity of contracts and, and other such arguments. But the idea is that yeah, if the population of Ghana basically let's let's look at it from private sector terms right in 2015 the population in ghana hired the ap and uafc to be the government to, and their representatives in that period if the population felt that the yes, ap and uafc did not represent their best interest in the petroleum sector then the population should have access to tell their current elected representatives to go back to say hey you need to go renegotiate this because we weren't happy with what the government we then elected did. Okay. I, I honestly don't have a better answer, a different answer, because that is just the best. Given the situation, it's the best read I, I could take, because if it is that we need to go and renegotiate and every 
you know, let's say a majority of Guyanese citizens want us to do that, we need to do it. And how we need to re- renegotiate is we need to hire international a- experts, benchmark where our contract is, benchmark where we should have gotten to or where we didn't get to, and go and negotiate with Exxon to say, look, here's the gap. We want to close the gap. It's the same with local content. Right? So that when you sit down in the negotiating table, you have hard scientific evidence to say, this is how much we should be getting as a nation in this position with this type of resource, with this quality of resource, and with it taking this much of investment to lift, and with you earning a sort, such a return. None of these numbers are truly secrets at this point because there's so much analysis and information available about the industry that you can use it to do a good negotiation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Boyer. Um, That has brought us to the end of our show. Uh, This week, we had a very fruitful conversation about local content, um, perhaps governance, and the oil contract. I am going to allow you a minute to give any final, any closing comments you'd like to make. Sure. I mean, the the, the key thing I'm concerned about right now, because it is within my, it's something I've advocated before I became chairman of the private sector commission, I want to keep the focus on local content. The, uh, with the contract, there's not much I can see. Um, I mean, personally, the thing is, it's hard to get everybody to get it on a single position in contract. My personal position is that I think our government should have negotiated better. And I think that they should have gotten better terms for the, uh, for the industry. If I were advising the, the the government of Ghana today on what to do, my my actual thought process would be to maybe to, you know go out to the referendum, get the mandate, and if the people of Ghana, if more than let's say 51 percent, 50, 51 percent of the people of Ghana say, hey, go and renegotiate, then we need to go and sit down and have these hard conversations, get that done. But coming back to local content. Um, I think we need to understand where we want to go as a nation, what skill set we want to have, and then we need to build the the industry that will get us there. Because it starts first with education, um, creation of all the the engineers and technicians who will you know turn wrenches and bolts in the industry, and it then moves on to getting those engineers and technicians jobs when they graduate, and not just. You know, we talk about meaningful jobs. And then you have the, the, the SMEs who will grow up into large companies supplying services to the industry. We need to be able to provide them as, you know, baby companies the protection they'll need to grow because it's not easy for these baby companies to come and compete with some worldwide, you know, or some regional giants. They need that help and protection from legislation. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um... I hope to have you back on the show later in the year when we do get to um, local content um, legislation, when we have those discussions. Um, I'd like to have you on a panel um, talking with other leaders in the business um, sec- business service organizations, if that's all right. Sure. All right, now. All right, Camille. Cool. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, I have to go run and, and deal with the generator. Okay, sure. <laughs> the joy, as you said, I think when you were waiting for me to get connected, I caught the bit of it. The joys of living in Guyana. Yes, uh, I, I thought you didn't hear. <laughs> I did catch that bit. All right, good night, sir. <laughs> Take care. Take care. View, viewers, listeners, thank you for joining us this week for another uh, fruitful conversation about your oil and gas sector and your patrimony. Please join us next week again on Tuesday night for Petroleum 101, where we have, we're going to have yet another expert to talk to us about what matters. Um, so I'm your host, Kimo King, and you're listening to Kaito Radio 99.1, 99.5 FM. Good night. <laughs>